My name is Danielle Gerstner, and I'm the branch head of Code 615, the Materials for Hypersonic and Advanced Systems branch. I'm very excited to be here today with Johnny Deloach to help interview him on his 40-year career with the Naval Surface Warfare Center at Carter Rock Division. He's been my direct supervisor for four years, and I've been here since 2011, and he's been my second line supervisor since then. Hi, my name is Maria Posada. I work for Division 61, the Materials and Manufacturing Technology Division. Uh, I've been here for the past 25 years um, and am excited to be here to celebrate Johnny's uh, accomplishments and be a part of the memories that he'll share and that we'll share about him in celebrating his career here at Carter Rock. Hi, my name is Alicia Tyre and I'm an administrative and technical specialist in the materials and manufacturing technology division. I've been with the division for 11 years and I'm excited to be here today to just chat with Johnny who has been my direct supervisor um, the entire time I've been here at Carter Rock and he's been an unofficial mentor for me. Um, He's really helped me to grow professionally and in my personal life. Um, he's the reason that I'm finishing school and just completing some milestones. So I'm honored to be here just to pick his brain and hopefully leave a little bit of his legacy behind. Hi, my name is Akil Channer. I'm a materials engineer with the Additive Manufacturing Group, Code 618. And I'm excited to be here today to not only memory and celebrate Johnny's career, but also learn uh, how he's been able to get to the point where he's at. I've been here for five years, and from the start, Johnny has been a uh, commemorative figure and a mentor for me, and a constant reminder that any achievement that I want to make, I can get to with the right amount of motivation and, and drive. Hello everybody, my name is Ashley Floyd and I'm Carter Rock's Community Outreach and Student Engagement Coordinator, which means I do all things field trips, getting into the school systems, underwater robotics, you name it. But formerly, I'm from the Welding, Non-Destructive Testing, Evaluation and Processing Branch. Actually, that fell under Johnny Deloach who hired me 14 years ago. I get to actually interview him on his way out. So that's why I'm here today. I'm really happy to be here. Hi, I'm Johnny Deloach. I'm with the Naval Surface Warfare Center Carter Rock Division. Been here for about 40 years with the Navy and about 27 here at Carter Rock. My career is coming to an end in a few days, and I'm really happy to get the opportunity to share some of my experiences, my hopes and dreams for the organization, and a few perspectives with you. I'm honored to have the opportunity to share some of this with you, and I hope you enjoy it. How are you doing today, Johnny? I am doing very well. How are all of you? Good, excited. Good, good, good. good. I'm excited. I'm about to say bittersweet, yes. Aww. I was going to say bittersweet, but uh, hopefully everybody got all their tears out and all their emotions because this is a powerful... Listen, you guys, you guys, you guys, I told you. <laughs> I'm just not going to be in Building 60. But I'm not going anywhere. All you got my my personal number. So. Y'all got the personal number. We're gonna make sure it's not the work phone, right? Okay. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Um, well, yeah, like, really excited to be here. Uh, just to you know hear about all the good times and all the fun times and talk about what this place has meant to you because you've been here for what, like two, three years, something yeah, like that. Yeah, something like that. Huh? Yeah, I've been here at. Uh, I got here at Carter Rock. Uh, in July, July 15th, uh, 1996. So I've been here a little over 27 years, but I had 13 years before that in Annapolis. So a total of 40 plus. 40 plus. Ooh, wow. It's a long time, oh, isn't it? Right. <laughs> before computers. No, wait, wait, wait. What did they do here before computers? <laughs> wait, how are we all old enough to have this conversation? No, anyway, I'm kidding. <laughs> anyway. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, well, we just want to just, you know, ask you a few things to um, just kind of capture some of that. And uh, we are really happy to have been asked to do this with you because uh, if you think about it, in 40 years, you've probably touched hundreds 
of people, hundreds of people. I don't know how many men like mentor, advice, employees, uh, contractors, places you've went, but you chose uh, a special few, <laughs> special, a special few you to special. to kind of dig into that some. Um, so yeah, I think uh, if Alicia wants to get us started, uh, we will love to have this opportunity. Oh sure, okay. The one who'll cry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, not the only one. <laughs> <laughs> cried again. Right here. Okay. So I know personally through my career that I've learned a lot from you, and I'm curious to know in your own career, are there any particular moments or lessons, experiences that stand out as significant in shaping? who you are retiring at. Sure, wow, that's a lot. Um, uh, I'm gonna start at the beginning. <laughs> you may need to, you may need to <laughs> get your popcorn. I'll need snacks. Get your popcorn, lean back. back. No, no. I, I, actually, actually I'll, I'll, I will start, start at the very beginning. beginning. When, uh, when I um, interviewed for my job at Annapolis, I had to interview with all the branch heads in the materials division. The last guy I interviewed with was a guy named Charlie Zanis. And he and I hit it off. And we hit it off uh, because I said, oh, I see you're a Jets fan. He had Jets stuff in the background. And he and I just chatted. And, and that message, the message that I got from that was that it was okay to share part of yourself and I just kind of carried that along so that was that was number one number two wasn't as pleasant so Maria can tell you that I'm really big on t writing technical writing so my first experience that helped shape how I feel about technical writing was the first time I had to write a letter and I, I fancied myself as a good writer and, uh, you know, so I get this assignment to uh, write a technical letter. And uh, my boss, Charlie, said, OK, I want you to put this in letter format. I want you to let uh, Bill Lukens take a look at it. And after he takes a look at it, bring it to me. And back in those days, you had to handwrite cursive, double space. All right. So. <laughs> So I write out my letter and, uh, and I'm writing the letter in the same fashion that I write, was writing narrative things at, at, in school. So I give it to this guy, Bill, he absentmindedly looks at it and he says, it's okay. So I take it over to Charlie and I'm really proud. And I put it in front of him and he starts looking at it. He starts squinting, I'm standing right behind him. And then, and you know how people just start flipping pages, right? So he starts flipping pages and he says, did Bill look at this? <laughs> and I said, yes. And he said, I'm gonna have to have, to have a talk with him and just, and just kind of tossed it at me. And so that was painful, but, but it made me dig in. It made me learn the value of first, you know, going to people with more experience, getting examples, getting templates, and and um, and so I'm a stickler on writing to this day, and I think it it started there. Um, you know, going forward from that, another thing, a big lesson was when Annapolis closed down. So the reason I'm here at Carter Rock was that the lab in Annapolis closed down. And it was part of the 1995 BRAC. And so we had to pick up and, and move. And that was traumatic for a lot of people. I was an Air Force baby, so I was used to, I went to like seven elementary schools, so I was used to stopping and starting. But to see the impact that it had on people and how devastated some of them were, it just taught me how much, how big, how, how, uh, significant the workplace is to a lot of people and what a big part it is in their lives and and I I tried to remember that when I became a manager that it's not just a place that you get a paycheck from Robert Denali uh, became my division head and he was well he was my 
mentor when I was in Annapolis. He then became my branch head. He then became my division head. I probably, I would say not even probably, I learned more from him than any other person that I've worked with. And he gave me a lot of lessons, but the one that he, that, that I go back to time and time again was when he told me, you know, never bite off your nose to spite your face. So what he was saying to me there was to be patient. You know, sometimes, you know, people do something and you don't like it and you feel like you've got to take action. But there's a risk that that action that you take is really going to demoralize somebody or put them in a position that, you know, they're not going to be, you know, they're not going to want to stay or not going to be able to be effective. And so based on that, I really thought hard about how I handled, you know, difficult talks with people in difficult situations. And it just taught me to take the long view with people and and mostly because people took the long view with me. I mean, you know, <laughs> um, I gave people lots of opportunity um, over the years to um, just say, yeah, it's not going to work out, young man, but they did. I go on and on and on. I mean, I get you guys, you, you guys all teach me lessons, man, all, all the time. So um, I, I, I think that's the, I think that's the, if I had to sum up the biggest one, um, it's to be patient um, with yourself, with your, with your organization, and with the people that you work with. I think that's something we all have noticed about you yeah. is that yeah, yeah. Quickly yeah. Right. That makes sense. you're that very makes patient. Sense. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, very. Which is every Actually, conversation. That's with why Johnny <laughs> put up with me. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, you're you're definitely very delicate in dealing with, you know, matters that are delicate and that I have appreciated that personally. I'm sure we all have. Right. Um, We've all experienced yeah. that and we are thankful. Yeah. So that that brings me to another question. So knowing, you know, that Ashley mentioned the large pool of, of people that, that you've worked mm. with and you've impacted. Where do you draw that that patience? Where do you where do you draw that strength to balance kind of your own internal struggles that don't come out when you talk to someone? You've seen my stress balls. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm I'm kidding. I, you know, I think how you how you interact with people a lot of times. You know, some of it's kind of wired into you, but a lot of it is your experiences and a lot of it is how people have dealt with you. So uh, I, I, I mentioned that I moved around a lot and I was an Air Force baby. So you find yourself a lot of times just almost forced to be um, considerate of other people and the way they think about things and the way they do things because so often I was the new person in the crowd and you know throwing in that I was a a little black boy most of the time growing up in a crowd of you know white kids um I mean it was the 60s and the 70s so it was a, it was a thing um so just I learned early on how to navigate those situations and I think that that's that's part of me now woven in but I also give my parents a lot of credit. You know, when you move around a lot, you're 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 pretty um, tight knit, and and your parents have to keep you going, right? So uh, my mother was a saint. She was so patient with, and always saw the best in people, and no matter what you did, she always made you feel better about yourself. And I always loved that about her. And, and I tried to embody that. And my father, on the other hand, he was the one that would tell you like it was. But then he had this amazing ability right after he told you like it was to then talk you back 
and still make you feel good at the end of the conversation. And, and a couple of people recently have said that to me, that, you know, whenever I came in and I had something going on and you and I had, would have a talk, I would feel better walking out. And that is one of the biggest compliments that, um, that I can get because I, I, I tried to pattern myself after my mother and father and they definitely, uh, they definitely did that. And I think the last thing is, growing up uh, black at the time that I grew up, you couldn't, it wasn't about you. It wasn't about you. There were things that were going on that were affecting you and everybody, you know, in your race, pretty much. And so the focus always had to be on uh, trying to make things better in general. And so what that did for me is it just caused me to not have to focus on myself too much and how things were going to affect me. And I think that just helped me with my empathy muscle. Um, you know, even though I wasn't, I didn't even know what the word empathy was at the time or what it meant. But, but I think it was just, it, it, it really enabled me to think about the other person a lot. And, um, and when I'm in those conversations, that's what I'm doing, you know. I don't want to pretend that there aren't times where I want to go, but, but I am able to put that to the back. And I always remember that everybody's trying to do the best they can, you know, everyone's trying to do the best they can. So. Now that I've, uh, still under your wings a little bit, but have. Uh, now that you say it, now that you left me behind, and you just <laughs> left me in the dust. When I'm in a difficult situation, I always pause and ask myself, what would Johnny do? What would Johnny tell me? <laughs> and, <laughs> and those words come up along with some other, you know, phrases or, or messages that you mention and, and things get better and I'm able to not always get it right, but at least you come to mind immediately in those wow. situations. Thank you, and I'm sorry for those times. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're a transformational leader. Oh, yeah, that's what you are. Yeah. I think anyone who's been under you, mentored by you, has been transformed as a professional and a person. So yeah. Yeah. that's just what I get from that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and talking about transformations, I've been here at Carter Rock, I know at least for the last few years, you've been very involved with diversity and inclusion and equity and accessibility efforts here at Carter Rock. You even won an award for it, if I remember As correctly. As did you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but just overall, I mean, thinking back on your 40 years of your career, how have you seen diversity and inclusion as a whole grow um, at Carter Rock? I mean, there's still a long way to go. But when I, so I'll go back to the beginning. When I started at Annapolis, uh, I was literally the only black technical person in the entire division and maybe in the whole department. Um, we had some interns that would come and go, but for a long time, it was just me. And um, obviously now there's a lot more diversity, not uh, uh, racial diversity, not only um, more black folks, uh, Hispanic, Asian, uh, but we still have a long way to go. We still have a very long way to go. I, I, I love the fact that it's part of the narrative now, that the focus, there's an, an intentional nature about it. And, you know, folks sitting at this table are, are a big part of that. Um, you know, it's got, we used to have here, um, we used to have uh, these sessions where all the managers had to uh, do a stand down and they would come to, um, I forget what they would call it, but it, oh, it was a diversity and inclusion summit. And it was a requirement, there were requirements, diversity and inclusion requirements for managers and they could satisfy that requirement by coming to this summit. And I had to, the 
the um, uh, pleasure of uh, of emceeing the, the, the deputy EEO at the time asked me, um, Elaine McKinney, do you remember Elaine? She was in, she was in Philadelphia, that's where our office was. But um, I remember after the first one, just, it was all day thing. And it culminated with um, some, it was right, right, uh, right there in the in the auditorium culminated with some kind of presentations on uh, things like um, uh, bias un unconscious bias and other things like that and just watching the crowd you could see how extremely uncomfortable <laughs> everybody was talking about that and uh, and so I, I I I had to give the closing remarks and then I kind of went off script and I said I can see it in your faces I can see it in your faces you're un you're totally uncomfortable with this and you're not sure you know there's there's a there's a a moral side to it and then there's a business side to it and I can tell some of you guys are, try, are struggling with the business side to it right I said that's okay that's okay you can support it because it's the right thing to do even if it doesn't make sense to you from a business standpoint in my it doesn't have to make sense from a business standpoint it's the right thing to do always being fair giving equal opportunity to everybody and I think over the years, I, I see that more. I hear more managers talking about it and emphasizing it. And, um, and I, not only the diversity aspect, but I, I see us doing things to make a diverse group of people feel included. And I think, m me personally, I think if you don't get the inclusion part right, then the diversity is going to be fleeting. And uh, like what you were doing yesterday at the holiday party and standing up the idea ERG, you know, those are all, those are all wonderful things. And, and I hope we can keep the momentum going. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. We're super excited from an ERG perspective. Um, so, I mean, You've been very involved even in the ERG too. So, what would be some of your hopes for Carter Rock as a future from a DNI perspective? First of all, my my first hope, because I don't know what the right answer is, but my first hope is that we keep searching for it, that we don't get exhausted by it, that we don't let. You know, I got a little disappointed, a little discouraged. Um, I'll just say a few years ago when I think we kind of lost our way, right? We, we, we kind of boxed ourselves in and organizationally convinced ourselves that um, doing the right thing wasn't the right thing. You know, we didn't, we, we were, I won't get political or anything, but I think you guys know what, what I'm talking about. There's a possibility that over the course of time, whether it's soon, sooner or later that we might be back to that we might be back to a situation where um, not everybody thinks focusing on diversity and inclusion is the right thing to do and I just I, I hope that we have the perseverance to stick with it and um, and it, it helps to have visionary leadership um, but you know, our leaders come and go every couple, three years, and it's not guaranteed. So it's going to be the people here that keep it going. And, and um, yeah, I see lots of good signs. I love the fact that we're picking up all the, the activities and, you know, the morale building stuff. And I think that's, that's just, that's super important. And I hope that's, the, and I would love to see just an organization that's kind of like this room you know I would love to see that I would love to see overall 
just that kind of diversity, the kind that we have in this room right now. So I mean, that was like really huge when um, the idea ERG wasn't a thing yet, but all the conversations and the experiences and all the people that joined on the groups. Um, I wanted to kind of touch into like your D and I call that when the nation was searching for answers and we had questions and there were so many emotions that you pulled. Uh, and I remember like it being 20, 25 people on that call that were, you know, affected feeling like directly, um, they were like, just wondering like what's next, like for the state of everything, like it just impacted everybody's core. And so like you had all ages from 80 year old employees on that call down to new hires on that call, business codes, detachments. Um, Cause at first it started, I think in the division, the call started division and people were like, Hey, we all want this. Like we need some more of these talks. And it was amazing to see you lead conversations about multiple sides of the same issue. And even when we talked about earlier, the caring and the uh, patience and the understanding, because one person on some of those calls would have a completely different view. And then, but the, if the leader of the call is being affected and moved by it, then it kind of gives way for everyone else to have an excuse. Well, if the leader's gonna do it, then everybody else can say whatever. But when someone interjected an unpopular opinion, this is what it's called, um, you had a way of breaking that down and then giving place a safe, giving people a safe space to, um, to just be themselves yep. and still feel heard. Like, is there anything like from that effort that you would want like others to kind of like know if, if those calls never happen again, if they keep on happening, if it goes down to one person or 50 people, like what is something that you would say is a sum of those calls and what you tried to do for starting that up at the time? Yeah, so for those that might not know, um, what Ashley's talking about is I started a, a recurring Zoom call um, about a week after um, George Floyd was murdered. And I felt like I needed an outlet to talk about it. And I talked with my family, but I, then I thought, you know, they're, they're probably my my friends and coworkers uh, here might also need an outlet. And I talked to a couple of people. I think I talked to Ashley. I think I talked, I mean, uh, uh, Alicia, I think I talked to uh, Jonathan Hopkins and said, I'm thinking about this. You think it's a good idea? And and they both might have said no. No, they didn't say. You guys didn't <laughs> say no. You said yes. And, and I, I was still apprehensive, but I did it. But but I knew, you know, at the time, if you remember back, you know, not everybody thought the same way about it. And so I, I, I felt like it needed to just be um, a venue for people to get whatever it is they were thinking, whatever they, it was that they were feeling. Just just give them a venue to talk about it. and. So non-judgmental was the key part, um, and I used to emphasize that on the calls. I don't have to do it now, but then I knew it was important to let everybody know that you no judgment here. People, you don't have to agree, but you don't judge. And um, and for me personally, I thought that was really important because I was confused, like. I know I saw it one way, and I was confused how anybody could see it another way. But but I knew the only way to do that was to hear hear people out. And um, so so yeah, that was that's been because we're we're still doing it. I mean, that was what June of 2020. Because I would have been judging them calls helped me. Yeah. I was I was yeah. I was side eyeing. I was like, I'm judging anybody that doesn't think the same way. Like, it's well, another like, testament to your strength. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and the hardest one, and Ashley brings this up, the the, the hardest one, uh, although it was maybe number one or two in terms of most powerful, was when we had the police officer, the ex police officer that came on, and um, that was huge. He gave us 
the uh, and he knew what he was walking into. And uh, but he he gave us the other side of it, the other the, the policeman's perspective and what you're thinking and the heat of the moment. And and I was that's the one I was probably most proud of because, you know, no attacking, just uh, we maintain the the spirit of the call. That was that was good. Yeah, at least I know I was still mad, but I felt like the ice melting off the heart. Some I was yeah. like, okay, all right. And, you know, and, you know, if y'all had those experiences, like you'd be like, so like, oh, I'm so angry. Mm -hmm. But then it's just like when you heard that side from a real person in the same environment that literally could see something a little bit different. The the cold heart was like, oh, okay. And it's and it's a person that some of us knew, right? Yeah. So you know, and we knew that he was a good guy, right? So then you realize that good people can have a different viewpoint. Uh, so that was really good. Um, the one that was most emotional for me was the verdict. It happened to be on a Tuesday. The calls were on Tuesdays at four thirty. And the verdict happened while we were on the call. And I, I, now I'm about to get emotional. It was emotional uh, because I don't know what I would have done. Um, if it had gone the other way. And um, yeah, and they, 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 the verdict came. We were on the call, and um, it was uh, it was more relief than anything because it was like, man, if if if, if people can't see th that for what it is, you know, everyone seen the video at that had seen the video at that time. I, I just felt like I don't know what else it was going to take, so. Yeah, it was really special to to share that moment with the folks on the call too. That was great. Yeah, and there's something that you said that really I uh, hung on to um, was in your reflection of DNI at Carter Rock and at a point where you're, you know, we are very far from where we started and where you saw it start, but the fact that you know, in times come, we could be back to that. Um, same position because of, you know, like we all know, history does repeat itself unless you take in um, that knowledge perspective and decide to learn from your mistakes. So I feel like I am like greatly in a representation of where you started from. And I do have my same aspirations to try to get to where <laughs> you ended at. And so what I would want to ask is what kind of advice would you have for someone like me um, in the beginning of their career to, you know, make that standpoint to extend their career to as vastly as you have? Well, first of all, set your sights higher. That's number <laughs> one. <laughs> all right. But I mean, you know, surround it to the extent that you can surround yourself with people that are supportive. If I look back on my career, I didn't appreciate it as much as I should have. Uh, when it was happening, but there are so many people in my career that gave me a chance, treated me with more respect than I had actually earned at that point. Um, and when you find those people, recognize them and, and cherish those relationships and cultivate those relationships. You know, beyond that, be good at whatever it is you're doing. <laughs> You know, be good at it. And, um, you know, I, I, in addition to being a singer, I used to be an, a, a little bit of an athlete. So I have an athlete's approach to what I do. And if you want to be good as an athlete, you practice. And you don't just practice, you know, you don't just come play the game. If you want to be really good, you don't just practice when the coach says it's time to practice. You practice all the time. Same thing for a musician or, you know, and and I would say commit yourself to being excellent, but not just like, I want to be excellent, I aspire to be excellent. Commit yourself to doing what it's going to take to become excellent. And, um, and then be nice, man. 
<laughs> be nice to <laughs> you. You 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 would have. I mean, being nice to people and respectful to people, um, you know, it gets you a long way if it's genuine. And that's the the, the last thing. Just you know, be authentic. You're going to run across people telling you that, you know, you have to be tall or you have to be short or you have to be, you know, um, more this, more that. Some of that, it's all well intended. And, and you listen to um, um, suggestions for improvements. But if you're not true to yourself, if you've got a, if you're masquerading as somebody that you aren't, it's going to come out eventually. And, and, you know, you need to have the confidence that you're, you're good enough. I can be me and, and excel. Um, so that's what I would say. Now, you can't call me back 20 years from now and say, Johnny, I it followed your advice. <laughs> and and I'm still sitting here next to Alicia and Ashley in the cafeteria. No better off. I can't off. promise that I will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kind of like uh, like echoing, like, um, I love that he had the kind of two part because I remember earlier on in, in my career, um, I was like starting to struggle. And, and he said, uh, Johnny said, Ashley, your personality is going to take you really far. You know, you're nice, you know, you're doing your, the customer support. And I, I get it. But he's like, if your work ethic doesn't keep up, then you're going to get held back. And and so I like that he talked about like the nice part, but and then the technical side, because it kind of goes hand in hand. You can be super technical, but if you're like nasty, I wouldn't want to work with you. You're nasty, right? You know, it's, <laughs> but that was it. Like literally showing both is like a testament to like everybody here because we've kind of seen that. Uh, like even like I like uh, Alicia, you can speak to kind of like, you know, your pivotal moment in getting your bachelor's and actually finishing up school. Um, you know, I think that that's huge because it's like you're kind of like trying to we all had that moment where we're trying to like find our way. So if you could uh, speak to that Great. a little bit. Now I probably will cry. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, to keep this youth centered, this we talked about this. this I will never forget advice that you gave me that I, I guess this is what piqued it for you, um, in the vein that time will pass you by no matter what. And I was looking at this goal as something that was insurmountable and that, oh, I have a late start. Everybody's almost at the finish line or they passed it and they're coming around again. And your advice to me was so simple and logical, which is just true to your personality, just very, kind but very clear and you told me you know four years four years will pass anyway and you'll look back and you'll say oh wow I could have done it and even if it took the four years that seemed like such a far goal that's right it'll go by anyway. that's right you, so you gotta live those four it? years anyway you might as well do it's something okay. with it <laughs> even if it's not in you know the conventional manner, even if it's difficult and you have to stop, as long as you continue and keep pushing and persevering, the time will pass and the next thing you know, you'll look up. And so that advice is what, I don't know why it was like a light switch for me, but I was like, why did I do this thing for them? But you have this way of kind of putting things into perspective and it, it lends itself to earlier, um, Maria mentioning how you can just have a conversation with someone and they walk out better. Uh, they walk out transformed. Oh, man. Um, I, th I think that's just indicative of you, who you are. I've always told people that you re you remind me of like our Obama. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I always, I've never I always, heard that before. I, I was like, wow. he reminds me of Obama, how he's very down to earth and kind and, and Obama dress. it's very smooth <laughs> and always has really good very sage advice <laughs> and so I know and I'm sure we all know that you actually got to meet President Obama and there is lore that there's a photo floating around of the two of you together which I think is iconic and I want it on a t-shirt <laughs> <So, laughs> like, vote for Johnny for president next <laughs> <laughs> so could you tell us like 
oh, did you meet Obama? Did you guys play golf? What, what's the yeah, story? Um, and the picture, <laughs> especially the picture, which we all should get a copy of after this. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think I could. So, um, no, I had the opportunity to be part of a, 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 a project. It was an initiative that President Obama stood up to create uh, regionally uh, focused manufacturing innovation institutes around the country. And there was one institute that was stood up in Detroit that was being managed by the Office of Naval Research. And we worked on the contract. And we found out that the White House wanted to do a formal signing. Um, and um, and then we found out that we would all get invited to that formal signing. So we, we show up a couple hours before, not anxious, but didn't want to be late. When I walked in with uh, Julie Cristaldo, who, um, uh, who was the person that had asked me to do it, and lo and behold, there were like 20 people that had already done the same thing. So we were all kind of anxious. And uh, I'm, I'll get to the picture, but this, I'm going to tell you the part, one part of the day that was really meant a lot to me. The, uh, so the government lead was the government program manager. That was me. And then the institute had a lead that was called the executive director. And... Um, as fate would have it, the executive director is also uh, black. His name's Larry Brown. I've kn known him for years. And he came in and he saw me sitting at a bench. Um, and he came and he sat down next to me. And after we said our hellos, we're just sitting there, not really saying anything, kind of lost in thought. And at one point I turned to him and he turned to me and I, and, and I think, it, I can't remember which one of us said, but we were like, do you know what's about to happen? <laughs> Just the thought of the two of us meeting President Obama, the first black president. I, I literally, I'm getting chills. Think, I, I literally get chills every time I, I say this, talk about this. But the gravity of that, how much, it was just, it was amazing, it was amazing. So we're mulling around, and um, this uh, a person called J.J., a woman, this lady called J.J. Uh, Rayner, she was a White House uh, uh, advisor um, that I would gotten to know as part of the project. She, she said, hey, Johnny, I've been looking for you. Come with me. And, they, and she took me into the blue room, which... Um, is blue. Everything in there is blue. Very blue. Um, and I walk in and I recognize uh, a guy named Frank Kendall, who at the time was like the third highest civilian in the Pentagon. I recognized him because I'd seen him on TV. I saw Rahm Emanuel, who was the um, mayor of Chicago at the time, because there was a second interview, being a second institute being um, stood up. And it was in Chicago. And those of you, you might know that he's a good friend of President Obama's. So he was in there. Um, I think the, the head of the, the Department of Energy was in there. It's just a bunch of folks. And, um, and we still didn't know why we were there. Um, and then all of a sudden, someone walks in and says, Okay, you pay attention. You're all about to meet President Obama. He's going to be here soon. And we were like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, oh, my God. I thought it was going to be the president will see you. No, no, no. But just as cool, right? So, so they said, he's going to come in this door. And we all need you. Lot. This is what's going to happen. You all stand shoulder to shoulder. And, and he's going to come in and, you know, you introduce yourself and shake his hand and then keep it moving, right? So we're all standing there. And, um, the a person that had just gotten appointed 
to a very high position at the Pentagon was standing next to me. And I, I'm going like this because she was very short. And she's standing next to me and she's like, we had been chatting a little bit before that. And she's like, Johnny, I'm too nervous. I, I don't know why I'm so nervous. Like I know all kinds of famous people. I come from New York and there are all kinds of famous people. I don't know why I'm so nervous. I'm like, it's, it's all right. All you got to do is say your name. It's cool. Right? You'll be fine. <laughs> and so we're all doing that. And then, and then uh, maybe probably three minutes before he was supposed to come, somebody rushes in and, and just for a second, and they say, he's coming in the other door. He's not coming in this door, he's coming in that door. Everybody was like, oh my God, what are we gonna do? So everybody's just frozen, right? And, 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 and um, so there was a table, big table behind us and we're all standing there like that. And people are looking around, like waiting for somebody to tell them what to do. And I give myself credit for this. I said, hey everybody, how about we just walk around the table and stand on the other <laughs> side? And they were all like, good idea, good idea. So. <laughs> So we go, we stand over there, and he eventually comes in. And I'm telling you, they opened the door, and it was like an orange glow. You know, <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> you know his aura yes. was there. It was, um, no, it was it amazing. Was. <laughs> and he comes in, and he was so cool. You know, the, the Frank Kendall and, uh, and the um, head of, of DOE and a couple other folks that he knew were at the beginning of the line. And so he's coming in hugging and, you know, dapping people up and all of that. It's very cool. And uh, then he gets to the folks that he doesn't know and he gets a little bit more, you know, business-like. He gets to the person that I mentioned. Uh, um, and, you know, she's maybe like 4'11 and he's so tall, right? And he gets to her and she's looking up like this. <laughs> and she says, hi. <laughs> and then he giggles and he's like yeah I am Barack Obama nice to meet you and, <laughs> and it was amazing and then he got to me and I managed to say you know nice to meet you Mr. President I'm Johnny Deloach and, and for whatever reason instead of just doing the handshake I did the handshake where you grab his, the other arm and and he had a little bit of reaction to that, I don't know. But, um, but then we went on through, uh, he shook everybody's hand and he's standing in front of us and he's giving us a pep talk and he's thanking us for, um, you know, our willingness to be a part of the program. He's telling us how important it is for the economy, growth of the economy. And, um, and then he says, so, how about we take a, a photo? Uh, so the, the first photo, I didn't even know my picture was getting taken, but he, the photographer took the photo while I was shaking hands. But then President Obama says, okay, how about a group photo? And he slides in right next to me. And I'm like this. <laughs> you know, I'm looking and I'm like, I don't think I'm supposed to be standing here. And I thought I was saying it to myself. And then he said, you're fine. Because uh, oh, obviously I was saying it out loud. Yeah. And, um, and so um, later I told people, you know, for that little bit of time, I was his right hand man. Cause <laughs> <laughs> I sent my father before um, I met President Obama before he came in. We were all in the blue room. And I, I said, hey, to somebody, would you would you mind taking my photo? And I sat in one of the chairs mm -hmm. and uh, they took the photo and I, I texted it to my father. And, um, and um, he called me right back, right? But I couldn't answer, right? And uh, later he told me, he said, I know people were crazy. He used to pick uh, uh, my youngest daughter up from school. He said, I was in the I was in the line, you know, you drive up, you get there early. He said, I was getting out of line, walking up to strangers, saying, That's my son. Look Aww. at my son at the White House. It was so he was oh my God. Yeah, that was just amazing. Uh, thanks for asking about that. Yeah. That that gives me another question. When you were younger, did you want to be president when you grew up like most kids? You know what? 
I was so um, from like six and a half to eleven. I lived in London, and uh, in going through elementary school, and I was in the fifth grade, and uh, it was the only, you know, black kid, little beady head black boy in the in the in the class in the yeah little keep it low the class picture I'm the only black kid there and um, I remember Mr. Cord Cordoba back then you get the paper report cards and the teachers would write stuff in the report on the report card and he wrote Johnny is the vanguard of the class and I didn't know what vanguard meant um, and he he said he'll be president in it was, I don't know, some year, 2000 and something. And that made me start thinking about it at that point. <laughs> that made me start. There it is. <laughs> there is always time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's true. I'm a little younger than yeah. my car president. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 We'll be your committee. Oh, oh, there we go. Oh, so he'd be like, look back, you know what? I need a White House committee. <laughs> look back to this conversation be like, I want these people around me, right? Like, yeah. uh, like even speaking to, uh, so you've, like, from your leadership, you've bred more managers and leadership, and leadership programs, people getting degrees, their dream jobs, and all that from a personnel perspective. But what about the technical side? Like, mm. are there, you know, one to two projects where you're like, you know what? That was the project at that moment, at that time, with that need for our fleet, for you know their, their desires and passion. We're at a research center. Like, what was that for you? Yeah. So there were a couple of things. Um, I got involved in all kinds of failure analyses. Um, oh, I thought you were about to say I failed a lot. No. no. It's not. Well, that <laughs> no. too. That too. But a lot of failure analyses that of you know really major components, important critical components on submarines and spent a lot of time, a lot of late nights and whatnot, and made a lot of friends and really got inspired by people that were, um, were um, not only brilliant, but just totally dedicated to the mission. A lot of stuff on HY-80 castings in particular. But I tell you, the, 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 the technical program that I think did the most for me in all kinds of uh, ways was um, back in the early 90s, there was a program called, a submarine program called Seawolf. And it was supposed to be the first submarine that used HY-130 plate. And, um, and there was weld cracking that happened and it was a big deal. It was on the front page of the Washington Post and um, and I got handpicked from Annapolis to go work at the Navy Yard to help them sort that out. And uh, and that was a that that experience in and of itself was was huge for me. And we didn't figure out how to fix it. We basically had to start over and scrap and it was like a hundred million dollar bill ish. Um, at least that's that was the public number, and that was that was a lot of money now. But back then it was a whole lot of money. And the reason it it was so significant was it was the first time really I worked on a collaborative effort. There was a guy at the time named Larry Becker, and he was the head of the Virginia class program. And he would be one of the recipients of this new technology. So he was at this big meeting um, that I had arranged and organized and coordinated. Like two days after the meeting happened, my department head uh, called me into his office. He said, um, Larry Becker, the head of the Virginia, the program manager uh, with the Virginia class program came to see me and he told me about the meeting that you held and he told me that he had never seen anybody command the respect of that many people the way you did during that meeting and 
my confidence went through the roof yeah. at that point. You know, that was the that that was the time that I really felt like I belonged. The thing that I'm most proud of technically is is um well two things. One was friction stir welding and that uh, Maria took over and and did a fantastic job with um that was that was huge. That was taking a a technology um, and just you know advancing it and proving out that it could be used safely for for Navy applications and that was, there was a lot of collaboration there, a lot of great work from a huge team of people. And then the other one was where we've come with additive manufacturing. I mean, um, <laughs> I mean. We weren't, you know, additive manufacturing was not on our map at all. You know, it wasn't on our radar at all. And uh, to see where it is now um, and where it's going to go. And, you know, I'm, it's humbling, but I'm also proud to know I was, I had a little part in all of that stuff. So. So 40 years, I mean, that's a really long time. And you talked Thank earlier. Thank you for pointing that out. Yes. You talked earlier about how you started off and you had to, you know, there weren't really computers around. So you had to write things down with pen and paper and write reports with pen and paper. Oh, and without computers, you know, you're doing failure analyses and you're doing all of these, you know, amazing technology areas. So. Um, are there any other things that you've seen in the workplace as a whole that you've seen change throughout the years, throughout these? Well, obviously computers is the, is the biggest one. Um, in fact, I was cleaning out my office. I was telling a couple people this earlier, and I found the first three biweekly highlights that I had to write when you were a junior engineer back then. You had to tell your boss, what did I do? And they were all handwritten. My penmanship was immaculate, back then. <laughs> absolutely immaculate. But, um, but yeah. Besides that, I mean, it's so much easier. I mean, there's so many more small groups that are coming up with big things now. It's, it's amazing. That used to be, you know, you had places like Bell Labs or, you know, these big organizations and, and innovation belonged to them, right? Because they had the pockets. But now, you know, it's, it's kind of been everybody's, uh, everybody's wheelhouse. Um, but the biggest technological change in, in my 40 years besides computers, in terms of, say, materials and, and manufacturing technology, Added manufacturing, hands, hands down, hands down. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. it's yeah. amazing. It, it is, but not only that, it it had the attention of very high level people. That it, you know, sometimes you you push a solution out that you know it's a great thing, but with additive manufacturing, it was something that we were doing that. But it was also, hey, we need to reach down from up high really and say, we point. need this. And there was almost an immediate use case right. yeah. uh, or an openness to use that um, and to demonstrate that it works. So, it, yeah, it's pretty amazing. No, and that, it goes on to this day, right? I think, I mean, we've been able to answer the bell and do a lot of great things because, you know, uh, there were, we prepared ourselves. We kind of kind of saw it and said there's potential and then we 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 had a small core group of people that kept getting bigger and so when the time was right and when that visibility came we were ready right but most technologies maria is absolutely right you know you're 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 trying to push it along you know from the bottom maybe you got a, a couple of people up higher than you that are supportive, but additive manufacturing is like you, you, today. We don't even have a choice at this point. I mean, people are going to make us do it at this point, and very high level people. So, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I, I won't use the the forty years, but um, <laughs> you just I, did, I would, but go ahead. <laughs> but I, I would say that uh, you know. Four decades you've been here. Mm, I don't know if that's better. 
<laughs> so what you know, you've I know that you've had opportunities to go work in different places. You've been asked to come work for us, and, and some of them are pretty sexy positions. <laughs> um, uh, yes, sexy and, positions. Um, and and um, I know that you've always maintained that you want to stay at Carterock. And, and uh, so just wondering what motivated you to want to stay here at, at Carterock and how do you keep that enthusiasm to, to show up every day? So what motivated me to stay here? I actually wanted to go into the military my father was in the Air Force. I wanted to follow in his footsteps. But, you know, he was in the Air Force. He joined the Air Force in the 1950s, and that wasn't very cool uh, for black folks at that time in the Air Force and or in the military in general. And so he really discouraged me and my siblings from going in. It means something to me to serve. It means, you know, I think the mission is so important. And I also never wanted a job. I, as an engineer, I never wanted, and I don't know why I even thought about this at the time, but I never wanted to be in a position where there was tension between what the right technical thing to do was and what's the thing that's going to make us the most money. And I felt like if I had gone into industry, even industry that was supporting um, the, the DOD, I would have found myself in situations where I was frustrated because we weren't doing the right thing because it wasn't profitable enough. But, but we're mission focused and I'm just a mission focused type of person. The enthusiasm, I mean, I've been here 40 years, but I feel like I've had in that 40 years, 10 different jobs, you know, because I work with different people. I got, you know, I, I, I amassed a pretty significant, um, you know, external group of contacts and I've gone to different countries and continents and it's just, you know, it's just been, it's not, I haven't been doing the same thing for 40 years. I think that's a great thing about working at Carter Rock in general, right? You could be here a long time and technically, you know, have one employer, but, you know, have several different jobs that are all interesting. So that's what's kept me here. And you guys, I mean, who the heck would want to I was waiting for it. Look, hey, was y'all waiting for that? Because I was, I was waiting. Come I was on. like, he better say something about the people. I mean, come on. Who's, I mean, come on. You know? Like, this is, like, listen, I, I've been, I've, I've worked with some of the nicest people. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and Ashley. No. <laughs> yeah, thanks for asking that. I'm not going to mention how long it's been because to me it's been a short time. Just <laughs> that's right. Here, that's that's right. But just measure it in the queue. <laughs> <laughs> but in that short amount of time, you got to see a, a, quite a big deal of things. And so, like, getting a chance to reflect on that, is there anything still on the docket that you wish you had seen before you know, your short time of leaving that you'd like to see at Carter? If I was a technical person right now and I wasn't a manager, I would not I would not be retiring. I'm so fascinated by what they're doing in additive manufacturing and trying to implement it, uh, you know, metal additive. It's a couple, a couple years away from really making a big uh, impact with uh, getting metal additive uh, implemented. And I'm sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna miss that. Um, oh, we're gonna call you. <laughs> <laughs> Organizationally, I think we're on the path. I, I'm. I would love to see more diversity at in the leadership positions because I think that's. I, I think that's. I think that's critical. I think that's critical. Um, you know, it. It. 
it hurts me a little bit that uh, Deej was the only other uh, uh, African American um, division head in the in the technical codes. Um, so I would have loved to, but we're on the right track. I'm not, you know, I'm not depressed about it or anything because we're we're trending in the right direction. We're trending in the right direction. Sounds like I hear you saying Maria for technical director. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but that's the last point that I want to make, though. The other thing, and this is why I hope you guys take me up, man. You got my, uh, I, I, I'm going to, long ago, the most joy, my, my real source of joy in the job was was seeing people whose lives I touched a little bit just do well, mm. you know, and, um, you know, I hope I stay connected enough to you and, and, and to others that, you know, I can, you can show me snippets, you can keep me abreast of how you're going, because um, I, I get excited about that. Uh, I look around and, and I see see where some folks have gone it's just like ah that's that's really that's really rewarding so my question is given all we've talked about at the table all the experiences the highs we didn't have many lows which is good if you would like what do you want your legacy to be what do you want everyone to remember about your career and your contribution to carter rock to the warfighter to the federal government and to personal lives. What do you want that to be? If I'm honest, I, I, I just want people to say, he was a really nice guy. I mean, yeah, that's what I want people to say. And I also want people to say, wow, that Maria Posada, she's really great. And somebody remember yeah, she used to work for Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> it just so that 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 that's that's really it. You know, as I'm I've been thinking a little bit about this, but as I'm coming down to it, to the end, I mean, there, I, I I've worked on a lot of stuff technically. When I think back, and the things that just spontaneously pop into my head are people's faces or or these little snippets of time these little you know just I don't know somewhat random occurrences that I guess they come to me randomly but they're just interactions interactions that'll stick with me you know people that'll stick with me and you know the technical work was backdrop <laughs> you know so so how, um, how I'd like to wrap this up, that was a perfect catalyst for, um, I feel what we're doing to grab and take all this amazing experience of four decades, <clears throat> uh, no, to the people, but um, just around the table, um, wanted uh, you to take something away from this as well. Um, so if we could go around the table and uh, take a minute or two to just um, you know, pour your heart out and express to John, you know, hopefully you'll get him to some tears, but no, that's not the goal. The goal to also highlight like what he meant for each of you individually, um, because I think that that's important. Like I think, in, and, and I know this actually factually from other friends in other industries and other workplaces, they don't like their bosses or they don't like their jobs or they don't like their coworkers. And you have someone here that's stayed here, like you said, and, and pursued the different technologies and manage the people, but mentor the people and, and came to the holiday parties and had um, you know, all of these interactions with Calamari on these travel trips. And, um, but what, why was it important for each one of you all to be here at this table? Okay, I'll try to speak. For me, uh, my background, uh, um, so I'm Hispanic uh, female was raised by a single parent that had a third grade education. Um, and school was not, you know, a huge focus. It was mostly survival, right? And so my, my way of 
giving back to my mom was to do the best that I could. You know, it was it was it was good to come to an organization that supported that development of the person. Um, and you know, I never had a, a father figure, um, and having a male role model, a, a male mentor that supported me like a father. Um, and it, so that, that really has in, you know, in the core has, has helped me in my career and to have someone care about me personally and see the, the skill and the goodness that I could bring to a technology and help develop that, um, uh, that is something that I had not experienced ever. And I think that was a huge driver for my success. And I, I, I owe it completely, I would say. Well, not maybe 99%, 1% was me. <laughs> <laughs> it was my ability um, to, to his belief in me. Um, and I would, I would tell you that your legacy doesn't end with us. It carries forth your light shines through to all the people that we interact with because I know personally uh, you have shaped me as a person and and hopefully that and I aim to, to carry that forward to other people to carry that torch thank you. along. Thank you. Yes. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Oh, I'm way too emotional. <laughs> I'm going to start crying in like two seconds. <laughs> but, um, John, you just, the last few years that you've been my direct supervisor have been amazing. Um, you are one of the nicest people that I've really met. Um, one of the nicest bosses that I've ever had. Um, you believed in me. You believed that I could do it. See? I know. <laughs> You believed in me, you believed that I could do it in terms of being a branch head. Um, not just that, in terms of the diversity and inclusion. I mean, I've just, I've learned so much from you, just from that aspect as well. Um, and then just as important, if not the most important in my mind is the family aspect. Um, and that's not actually even something we talked about during this interview, but. Um, I know your your wife has an extremely important had I guess she's retired but had a very important job and you really stepped in and supported her and you and I have talked about that a lot and so just the work life balance aspect of it and I really I I look up to you for you know what you've done. Thank you. We don't let a kill go last just in case. A <laughs> kill you go last. <laughs> I know. <laughs> At least my favorite scissors. I'm gonna get. <laughs> if you were done, were yeah, you? I'm good. <laughs> that was a good one. That was a good one. So, um, I guess I just snowballing here. So, um, I worse and worse. <laughs> so I can actually relate a lot to Maria and also the things that Daniel has said. Um, I think I, I wrote on your retirement poster that you were like an unofficial dad to me. You, I, I never expressed that to you, but it was almost just having that encouragement from a male role model who just wanted to see the best in you, just believed in you and advocated for you. And you have done that for me as a non-technical person in a very technical space. Uh, you've always been an advocate and very supportive just from my first interview so um, that has always been something that's propped me up in in my career I always knew that if there was anything I wanted to try or explore that you would be supportive and help me to you know really rationalize and think about if something was beneficial for me and so I've gotten to do a lot I um I have gosh, experienced a lot in my even just personal life over the course of the 11 years that we've worked together. And you have always just been there in ways that I don't think other supervisors or, you know, colleagues would be that have meant a lot to me just personally. And um, yep, they're coming. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah, so, um, 
So for me, it was important to be here to thank you, to thank you for um, being selfless, to thank you for um, being authentic and for being an advocate for those of us who, you know, don't always get opportunities or don't always know how to find our place. And um, and you, I will probably always use your real cell phone number because <laughs> you are an important person in my life. And so I thank you. And your legacy definitely lives on through all of yeah, I gotta let a kill go last. And I, I, and you know, and you know, speaking of diversity, I'm, I'm okay with being a woman and crying on screen. So that's why we have him go last. Um, and it's like, you know, to sum up, I've been here 14 years, and, you know, the technical side, my, technical side got better because of those conversations. People gonna say I was nice. I know it my work ethic caught up because of those hard conversations. Um, but then also the personal, when we go through personal things, I remember when I got a call that wrecked my life and I came into your office just feeling just like I dropped at the bottom of a 50 foot well. He's like, let me sit there. You let me cry. You let me talk. And then he said, do you need to go home? And I had friends at the time where they were forced to still do their work because of their jobs. And you let me go home and told me to call EAP when I had, didn't even remember that we had that as a resource. Um, like so many of these memorable times that like the rest, we've all been here different times and how we are each e echoing the same is huge. And so, like, I know I would not be in my dream job if it wasn't for you. And sitting here, being able to say thank you and have this conversation that we can show this, it's this family feel. Like, I don't know if other groups ever felt like this, but, and I know that, you know, PAO's got this great team. They probably feel like family feeling this, <laughs> but I felt like and they felt like family. To have a place you spend more hours away from your family to then also, yes, bumps and screw, scrapes, we had our, you know, our times, but for, I've never thought I would ever have been able to experience as a little girl coming out of college, just trying to get a job anywhere during the height of the recession, to come to a job that I have loved, a career that I've enjoyed, and to also feel like I'm going to see my other family. It's just because of the umbrella that you've had here. So, thank, thank you. you. Thanks. So. All right. Even though I can't, I, I don't think Bob is going to be anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> we've already been feeling because um, Giants. You know, again, it's been uh, a short time for me, but it's been, you know every bit as meaningful the, the whole time because from the start of things all the way up until being in this moment and understanding that you know for this this moment it it's just a reflection back that you know what i or a verification of what i've always felt that you know you wanted to see me do well you wanted uh good for me from the beginning and it's just important and reflects that, you know, what I was feeling was, was correct. And, you know, I've always been surrounded by strong women in my family. Um, the men's side, you know, they're there, they're there, but they've never made um, as big of an impact on uh, myself for the achievements that I had and being able to see you and then get the, the care enough to individually look out for me. And I know you always, every once in a while, trying to check in 
on me, even if it wasn't directly from me. I know that the comments coming down asking how I'm doing was coming uh, from a relayed message from you. And that that's just been a supporting factor of like any opportunity that, you know, you've seen me in and maybe it might be unexpected that, you know, what's he doing here kind of thing. Uh, it's always the reflection back of when we make eye contact that, you know, you are proud that I, I am in that, that setting and it's, you know, just spun up uh, a determination for myself to uh, fill the shoes that you, the big shoes that you've laid here um, and try my darndest to uh, do what you've done for me for the other people coming behind and be, being that symbol of inclusion for me. Because seeing you in that position, again, like I was saying for, you know, my reason in getting to talk to you is that you've represented that I can shoot and achieve that opportunity of being the, that leadership figure and I, and I can then take that and make an impact on those coming. It's like, it's not to say that that's the only way, but it's, it's made a difference for me. And I, I want to thank you for that. Thank you. Kia. So oh, this that was, was wonderful. on here for 40 more years, like, right what would you say to future employees that would watch this you know i think i would say that um we we have a a vast array of technologies that we work here and even within each technology there's you know countless uh, technical areas and there's lots of opportunity to do well um, and make a difference but I think if you listen to this from start to finish I hope you take people take away the importance of people the importance of, of developing relationships and trying to get to know people and just being a good person and trying to help do your part um, you know you guys, this, the focus of this was me, but there are tons of people that helped me. You mentioned family, my wife, Lauren. I traveled a lot during my traveling heyday. And we have three girls at home and, and yeah, I held her down, but she held me down too. Um, and uh, um, I always remembered, I think having three girls kind of helped shape me also three daughters I, I think that that shapes me being a girl dad does something to you it makes you see life in a certain way uh, and I, I think it helped with my empathy and, and I, you know and, and being considerate and trying to understand uh, other people's um, um, what they might be going through right and if in in the process of going through and being excellent at whatever you're doing. You also pay attention to the people in your life, the people that are supporting you, that aren't there with you every day, the people that are, are supporting you on the job, and the people that you're supporting. If you really have a focus, an outward focus on, on those people, then um, people is where your mark is, is really made. And, and um, I hope people take that away from this. Um, I'm trying hard to hold it together. I have so many things I want to say to each of you, Maria. I don't know that I've met, and I literally mean this, anybody with the, the determination that you have and the work ethic that you have combined with just being brilliant and compassionate. I just, I, amazing Danielle you've got an energy about you and an authenticity about you a desire to do well and just make whatever environment you're in better and I respect that Alicia I've told you since we met how talented I think you are and um, I and you know Alicia was the one when she sat outside my office, Alicia, you were 
on those on those days that weren't going particularly well. You were the one that made me feel at home. Is you were the one that come in and talk about the movie Boom, Boomerang. Or we would talk <laughs> about, you know, Kendrick Lamar. And we had the same taste in music. And I would say sometimes that you're the only person in this building that I can talk to about that. And you, I, you get me. That's right. Um, you know, Ashley, man. Everybody knows Ashley. You just... You, you're just a just a burst of positivity no matter where you go and you and I yeah we we had some hard discussions but but I always felt like you were you wanted to do well and I'm so happy for you I feel like more than anybody else one of the things that I one of my highlights is the fact that I truly believe that you are in the exact place that you're supposed to be at the exact time that you're supposed to be there. That every all the things that you've gone through, good and bad, have been leading you to this to this moment in this position. I'm, I couldn't be happier for you. And then Akil, um, I, I saw little snippets of myself in you, and I'm just like. I'm going to make sure <laughs> I'm going to keep an eye on him. I'm not going to hover. I know Jonathan kept got tired of me saying, okay, Jonathan, I haven't seen Akil. What's Akil up to? Let's make sure Akil is good. Come see me, Akil, you know, because um, it's, I, I'll admit, it's important for me as, as a black man to see another young black man get the opportunities that I got, right? And I had people looking out for me, too, and, and I see a lot of potential in you and all of you. So I wish you guys the best. Thank you so much for doing this. It means a lot. It's not an accident or random that you guys are sitting here. You all have special places in my heart and you always will. Thank you. Thank you. you almost got me. <laughs> <laughs> I think we got it double. Yeah. Thank you so much. This is not the end, and it's, it's the retirement, but passing of that baton, and that's us. And so, you know, this is like our charge to ourselves. We've talked a lot about legacy. We've talked a lot about um, mentorship and, and careers and so many different aspects. I know Danielle touched on the work-life balance. There's so much of this multifaceted life that we're sitting here and now we're like the fourth leg, but now we all imagine like different tracks running, right? And that exponential reach that we have because of, you know, this, this monumental person, Johnny, <laughs> monumental career. And now we each have this fourth leg and now spreading that because we're in completely different realms and stages of career and areas of business that, you know, thank you for giving us um, that baton because we run it. Yeah, you know, we can <laughs> put on our good shoes, we we'll put on our running shoes after this, but we, we have accepted that from you, that all of what you've done, even in retirement being the end of the career, like... <laughs> What would Johnny do is going to go <laughs> and ripple through um, so many different areas that you probably will never, ever, ever, ever even imagine or dream or just grasp because of that fourth leg. And, and we have, of course, just five people here, but I, I can almost guarantee that there's a lot of other people that have that fourth um, baton in their hand. And I'm really glad that we were able to bring that out. And now everybody watching that video is now going to have that fourth baton too. So thank you for the oh, conversation. Wow. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.